Good morning. I'd like to thank Gabriel for asking me to be involved in this excellent conference. It's a shame that we're not able to be together, but I look forward to visiting Chile in the near future. Uh, when Gabriel was asking me to, when Gabriel informed me that there were a number of talks I had to do, the most interesting I think is this one, and it's related to the changes and recommendations that have occurred over the last 18 months comparing open versus EVAR for treatment of AAA disease. We're going to make a bit of a um, uh, comment primarily on the NICE guide, guidelines because essentially that's where this controversy really starts. It's an interesting discussion and really reflects on how the technological changes have, uh, have happened quite quickly in vascular surgery and then sometimes it's hard to come up, to keep up with them. Essentially, the NICE guidelines are developed to recommend treatment options and algorithms uh, to the NHS. Uh, in 2015, uh, there was a plan to establish some guidelines for the treatment of uh, AAA disease. Uh, there were many meetings and discussions and controversies, but overall, the most controversial component of this otherwise excellent document relates to the area about referring patients for open surgical repair. The recommendation really says that uh, for patients offered open surgical repair, if they had an unruptured aneurysm and, meeting, and met specific criteria, mainly related to abdominal copathology and anaesthetic risk of medical comorbidities. It was quite controversial and it drew a lot of comment both from uh, within the vascular fraternity, but also within the uh, um, medical industry uh, and also uh, interested parties. Essentially, they based their recommendation that open surgical repair was the best option for people with an unruptured infrarenal and abdominal aortic aneurysm on the long-term harms. Whilst EVAR is associated with fewer perioperative deaths and left time in hospital, they'd concluded that there was a worse long-term survival than open surgical repair and more long-term complications which led to further procedures. Now, I think everybody who's grown up and been involved in changing their uh, AAA practice would understand that uh, that it does occur. Certainly, EVA has attracted a greater secondary intervention rate than, uh, than would otherwise be the case with, with open repair. But there are significant changes in the medical management of multiple medical problems over the last 10, 15, 20 years that have been established that may contribute to that problem, but also means that open surgical repair doesn't easily get performed and doesn't come with its own complications. So NICE guidelines basically reached uh, their recommendation based on the evidence that was available. It incorporated large randomised control trials uh, and made considerations based on the long-term costs and benefits of EVAR versus open repair. And one of the best and most interesting aspects of their, uh, of their uh, investigation was that where recommendations and the aim of the recommendations were actually made not necessarily based on the technology, but based on the management of complicated AAA repair. This uh, is a recently reduced, uh, a recently released meta-analysis looking and invest, uh, looking at some of the things that EVA, um, some, sorry, some of the things that the NICE trials had investigated. Uh, this is a meta-analysis looks at EVA trials essentially, and like the NICE trials that were developed. Um, the conclusion was that EVA does certainly have a lower hospital death rate, um, but at, out to 10 years, all cause mortality remains the same. 10 years is a significant follow up period for vascular patients. Most of the patients that we operate or are involved in have more chronic issues 
and inevitably one of them will get will um, will cause them greater risk of mortality than another. So beyond ten years uh, of follow up is uh, is uh, certainly a long time in the life of a vascular patient. But this is the most important aspect that really uh, encouraged the uh, nice group. Uh, sorry, the um, the, yeah, the NICE group in the NHS to make this conclusion. At about eight years, secondary intervention, aneurysmal rupture and death was higher in the EVA group. So the conclusion in this particular meta-analysis, which was adopted by the committee, suggests that EVA has a better initial outcome, but carries increased risk of death at eight years. But that's not universal in all the uh, large randomised control trials that have been performed. This is a review of the OVA Veterans Affairs Cooperative Study Group, which looked at overall death rate. And it made an interesting conclusion that at least 50% of the deaths uh, were related to non-aortic problems uh, then in the endovascular group. So it's obvious that the EVA patients will not be subjected to their regular problems that, they, that a vascular path has compared to traditional open repair in the perioperative period. The other interesting point of this particular component is that the perioperative survival advantage continues for seven years, but there is an increased desk in the endovascular repair group. It's hard to know exactly what these later deaths are related to. And if it was patients who had open repair, would that trend continue? The conclusions, and I think it's not without um, some justification, is that patients that had a death related uh, to um, uh, perioperative, repair, perioperative repair in either the EVA group or the open group were often the frailest patients. And in those patients that had the EVA group, whilst they survived that initial 30 day uh, period, they were often the frailest patients. And initially when endovascular repair was used in the last 10, 20 years, it was often more commonly offered to patients who were in the frail group. So the patient population was high risk initially, but the open repair group tended to have their complications develop in that short period of time around the operative procedure. So inevitably this released a significant amount of controversy. So uh, after uh, there's a lot of correspondence, I'd encourage you to read the discussion amongst various interested parties over the uh, guidelines and how they've been put forward. And particularly that idea that the open repair is a better option in the long run for patients than uh, EVA. More interestingly enough, the part of the recommendation is, does an unruptured AAA need repair? I think that's an unanswered question. And uh, in our own practice, uh, unfortunately, uh, it's, we don't have the benefit of hindsight in patients who present with eruption AAA. They will present and often be, and with a significant risk of instant death, you can obviously conclude that the repair needed to be done in that patient, but trying to predict in the future has always been a difficult problem with aneurysmal disease. And there's no ethics committee in the world that will approve a trial which looks at the rate in which ruptures occur by observation. So with all these controversies in relation to EVA versus open, this is the biggest problem that we have. When EVA was adopted in, the, in Australia in, the two, in the, around 2000, so in a meaningful way, we've seen a significant decline in open aneurysmal repair, but a marked increase in EVA. And I think that's mainly related by, to driven by surgeons themselves, understanding the real benefits of this procedure, the EVA has over open surgery, but also um, by the patients who become more educated uh, in, in, um, in their identification of their disease and what treatment options are available. 
It's also quite difficult to convince patients uh, that the best outcome for them is an open procedure over an EVA, particularly with the uh, instantaneous morbidity associated with a significant uh, operative procedure. It's even hard enough to convince patients to have an EVA uh, for a disease that they don't have any problems with. The other issue that we're having, and this is a problem I suspect is occurring around the world, is that if there was a sharp uptake in the number of amount, the amount of open surgery, the general experience of uh, our vascular trainees, in particular with open aneurysm repair, is low. We're not able to get adequate numbers now, so that a um, uh, a vascular trainee would necessarily uh, be competent enough to perform an open aneurysm repair without some further degree of study. On the flip side of that, however, is that they are becoming very proficient in EVA. And the recommendations and indications for EVA, whilst they are much the same as they've been for the last 20 years, the subtleties, the experience that we have with different types of graphs mean that those patients are being appropriately managed in the first instance. If the aim is to reduce our post-EVA uh, uh, aneurysm-related death, then I think by improving our techniques, improving the graft quality and technology, and also identifying those patients who could potentially uh, present as problem, obviously becomes more of an important issue uh, then certainly recommending them for an open repair over an EVA. The other issue that we've had, and this is certainly, I don't think, limited to Australia, whilst we've had some good response to the COVID crisis, uh, is around the world, critical bed capacity would be required if an open repair became the main state of treatment. And also adjusting patients' expectations is a significant problem. And I'm also wondering whether trials that began in 2020 would present the same outcomes of trials that occurred back in, 20, in the year 2000, when most of the large randomised control trials we, we, were being uh, dreamt up and, and uh, considered. I think the other issue is that we need to really understand whether our current way that we manage uh, techniques we use EVA, such as IFU guidelines, whether they actually make an impact in long-term outcomes. And I've included this heading really for us to consider when, we can, when we're recommending people have an open repair over an EVA, that in fact patients that would necessarily not um, be considered for EVA uh, because of various uh, anatomical abnormalities may now, because of change in experience, uh, be able to be operated on a, uh, with an endovascular technique rather than open surgery. So in conclusion, there's no doubt that EVAR has revolutionised the management of AAA. And there is a short-term benefit. There's no doubt about that. Um, patients are living longer. Um, and whilst their comorbidities are restricting the risk of um, aneurysmal death is really the aim of any aortic intervention, uh, long-term mortality inevitably remains the same. Ironically, within the United States, because of the COVID crisis, there's been a, for the first time in many, many years, there's been a reduction in the um, uh, age mortality rate. Uh, and whilst I think we, this is a one-off occurrence, uh, I think mortality rates will reach a plateau at some stage in the future, and that's when we've got to consider whether that we've got to incorporate that type of information into our decision-making for EVA. If a patient requests an open surgery, I think that's reasonable to recommendation, recommend them. However, the reality is convincing a person of what their life's going to look like in eight years let alone three, six months after the diagnosis of an AAA is actually quite difficult. And finally, I think what we really need to focus on is not so much that there's a, um, uh, that open surgery versus EVA. I think what we need to focus on is what happens at eight years in those patients who have had an endovascular repair. If there's graft failure, 
uh, if there's problems with surveillance, if there's issues with ender leaks, then they can be addressed uh, and uh, improve the longevity of an endograft uh, and also uh, they uh, reduce the risk of high endorismal mortality. Thank you very much.